Hi, everyone. Welcome and happy Tuesday. My name is Alex, and I'm happy to be here with Dr. Tara Brock for today's Talks at Google. Tara is the founder and guiding teacher of the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, DC, and she's been practicing and teaching mindfulness meditation for over 40 years. She's also the author of two international bestsellers, Radical Acceptance and Radical Compassion, and her weekly podcast is downloaded over 3 million times a month. In today's talk, Tara will dive into the role of mindfulness and self-compassion in our personal and work lives, and in particular during those challenging, stressful moments that we experience. Tara used to have more of a type A control personality, so she knows the challenges of trying to slow down and of trying to just sit with yourself compassionately when we're often taught to problem solve and take action. She'll walk us through a key concept from her book called RAIN, so we can start to play around with what that awareness and compassion actually can look like and feel like in one of those hard moments, be it in a meeting, at the dinner table, or really anywhere one may show up. There will be time for questions at the, head, at the end, so please go ahead and drop them into the live chat. And with that, let's dive in. Welcome, Tara. We're happy you're here. Uh, thanks so much, Alex, and welcome, friends. I'm so glad to be with you doing this with the Google community. So as Alex said, we're going to take some time to look at how when we're feeling stressed, we can find a way back to being more calm, more clear, really more at home with ourselves. And I thought I'd start with a line from a poem that I really love. This is by Martha Postlewaite. And she writes, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life. Create a clearing in the dense forest of your life. And as you listen, you can probably sense for yourself what that means for you, your dense forest, whether it's a lot of worrying and planning or a sense of to-dos, that list that never goes away, um, just the demands that stress us. So we need to learn the art of pausing, of how to create a clearing so we can bring forward our heart and our intelligence. So we're going to explore how to do this with a weave of mindfulness and compassion. Um, the acronym RAIN, what we're going to be calling on, can help us when we're emotionally stuck. It can help us come back. And the acronym is R for recognize, A for allow, I for investigate, and N for nurture. And we're going to come back to how to do it, but I'd like to say that really more than any other meditation um, over these last years, people have told me, rain saved my life. <laughs> rain saved my life. They just People have found it invaluable at work, at home, and of course they've merged for so many. So since Alex outed me on my type A tendencies, I thought I'd, I'd share a personal story. My mom came to live with my husband and me when she was 82. And she arrived during a super busy stretch. I had deadlines on my writing. I had a huge amount of teaching lined up. So I felt a lot of guilt that I wasn't spending enough time with her and constant anxiety about getting things done. So one day I was in my office and writing a talk on my computer. And she came in with an article to share from The New Yorker. And I didn't even look up. <laughs> I was just really immersed. And as I watched her retreating form leave the room, I thought to myself, you know, I really don't know how long I'll have with her. And that really hit me. So I decided to pause and do some rain, some of this meditation. And so the first part was recognizing that there was anxiety going on, just allowing it to be there. And then when I started investigating, you know, really in my body, because investigation is somatic, it's like to feel it in our body, I could feel the squeeze of, of fear, I knew it was this kind of fear of failure, you know. And then I brought some nurturing, uh, I often do it by putting my hand on my heart and just sent some care into that, that vulnerable place. And reminded myself that, you know, if I relax, the teachings that I want to offer will flow and um, that I can be here with her. So I did over the next months, a number of rounds of this. And what happened was, 
I just calmed down about getting things done. And I was able to show up more. I was more present when we'd, you know, have our giant salads for dinner and taking our walks on the river. Well, she died several years later, maybe three years later. And I had huge, huge grief and sorrow, but I didn't have regret. You know, in a way, what I realized was that rain saved my life moments with my mom. And it's really what motivated me to write uh, my most recent book, Radical Compassion, which is a guidebook on rain. So for most of us, myself included, the times that we most need clarity and balance and open-heartedness, those are the times when we're stirred up and we're least able to pause and, and create that clearing and find our way home. So the value of having a practice like RAIN is it's actually easy to remember and it can bring us back when we're most stuck in kind of perseverating and anxiety and reactivity. It's helpful to consider that when you're caught in anger or fear or confusion, it's a limbic hijack. You know, your survival brain is taken over and it happens to all of us. And when it happens, we're in a trance. We're not in our full reality. We don't have access to our full brain. Um, the world has shrunken and we're really fixated and we've lost contact with our full awareness, with our full intelligence, with our creativity. And now neuroscientists can show exactly what's happening. When the limbic uh, system is activated in that way, uh, the prefrontal cortex, the more recently evolved parts of our brain, get deactivated and our brain's not integrated. So we're actually being run by our survival brain. There are three common ways that a limbic trance appears. And these are signals and I'm sharing them with you because each is a flag that, hey, this is the time to do rain, okay? So one of them when you're stressed is, and you'll know this, anxious, obsessive thinking, that our mind just circles around and that's the dense forest of the moment. And we get kind of disembodied. We're not aware and in our senses or in our bodies. We're just fixated on what's going wrong or what around the corner we think can go wrong. There's a story I heard where a mom uh, sends her son an email and it says, start worrying, details to follow. <laughs> and I love it because there's so many have experienced that when we're anxious, it's like really, it's just anxiety looking for its next target to glom onto. And, and then most of our thoughts are just colored by that background of anxiety. Okay, so that's the first flag of a limbic trance that we're often running with kind of obsessive anxious thinking. The second, when we're stressed and insecure, is that the survival brain tends to blame others. We get into conflict with others. That's the way the tension expresses. When life's not going our way, we tend to make others wrong. You know, we blame them. They become the bad other. Someone sent this to me recently about a woman who's in a job interview. And an interviewer asked, well, tell me, what do you think your biggest character defect is? And her reply is honesty. And he says, honesty? I wouldn't consider honesty a defect. Her response, I don't care what the hell you think. <laughs> and it's a completely silly example, but you know what I mean. It's like when we're hijacked, it just blurts out. Things happen quickly and it's often blame. It's often anger. And we say and do things we regret. Um, and often the stress happens because others are not agreeing with us. So keep an eye for that version that we're so identified with our, our views and our beliefs that we really get threatened uh, when people have different takes. There's a saying that the world is divided into those who think they're right. And that's the whole saying. <laughs> it, it's like, and I saw a cartoon that said, I can't hear you 
over the sound of how right I am. So we're stressed, we kind of shut down and get reactive when people don't agree. And then as we know, it can have really horrific consequences um, because our beliefs lead to actions and they can be really harmful. Those who disagree can become the enemy. And um, you can feel in our world right now how that trance of I am right, how it divides and brings up so much fear and hatred. And really, no matter how progressive our beliefs are, when our survival brain generates that trance of, of blame, when we're caught in blame, I'm right, bad other, we're really participating in the same violence that we are objecting to. Okay, so when we're in a limbic trance, the first is anxious fear thinking, the second blaming others, and the third way that, and this is the third call for RAIN, is we turn against ourselves, bad self. And it's so pervasive that we have that harsh inner judge. Um, it can be really, really chronic, that sense of, I'm falling short, it's, I'm never enough. It's like one uh, cartoon with a, a dog on a psychiatrist's couch, and he's saying, you know, it's always good dog this and good dog that, but is it ever great dog? <laughs> and we know it, you know, and sometimes, of course, the, the judgment is really, really acute, and there's a deep sense of, of failure and of, of shame. At any level, I've come to call this the trance of unworthiness. Uh, and if I asked you right now, if we could do hand raises, which we, we can, but it's, I didn't plan on it. So if I asked you, how many of you think you judge yourself too much? Most of us would raise our hand, but we don't, what we don't realize is how that undercurrent of not good enough, failing in some way affects everything. It affects our mood for the day. It affects how much enjoyment we can have. It affects how close we can be with others. Because if we don't trust or like ourselves, some part of us suspects the other's gonna feel the same and then we get defended, fearful. The trance of unworthiness stops us from really taking risks to be creative. So the fun, I always think that the most fundamental truths are the ones we forget. And one of them is we really can't be happy and we can't love life if we're turned against ourselves. I'll share with you that one friend was by her mother's bedside when her mother was dying. Her mother was in a coma. And at one point her mother woke up and looked her in the eye and said, you know, all my life I thought something was wrong with me. And that, those were the last words she said. She closed her eyes and went back into a coma and died. Well, for my friend, this was um, like one of those gifts that reminded her that you can go through your whole life with that belief or attitude of not being okay and how much it really stops us from living our moments. So this is the trance of unworthiness. And of course, we how do we get it? Well, caregivers send the message in some way, you should be different. You should be, you know, less needy or more successful in this or more cooperative in that. But it's really sent down through our society, through the values of the culture. And for many contemporary societies, they really reinforce the trance of unworthiness because we have very few pathways to natural belonging, you know, to the earth, to our families, to community. There's always these, there's standards that we have to meet, you know, and a lot of competition. And of course, the most toxic amplification for the trance of unworthiness comes from institutionalized violence against the non-dominant cultures in our society or non-dominant populations, whether it's uh, on the basis of gender or race or racial caste system that we have. 
Um, Toni Morrison, many of you know, writes that in this country, being American means being white. Everyone else has to hyphenate. And that's very telling that the message to marginalized people is you are inferior. So stepping back, whatever the degree of self-judgment or shame, when we're turned on ourself, we're living in a trance and we're really forgetting our own basic value and goodness, our aliveness, our awareness, our love. I have a a friend who's a, a palliative caregiver and she has been by the side of tens of thousands of people as they're dying. And she says that the greatest regret of the dying is I didn't live true to myself. You know, I lived according to others' expectations. I lived bridled by my own judgments. You know, I lived, you know, according to what I, the demands I imposed on myself. But I I didn't live true to my heart. And I think of that a lot because it's not just the dying. I think a lot of us feel that there's a gap between that sense of really what it would mean to live true to our hearts. And so what we'll be doing is looking at how rain can help us live true to ourselves and how we can shift from anxious reactivity to responding to our lives from a a wise and, and steady heart. So again, let me review the acronym and maybe I'll share an example or story of how one person used it or a couple of people used it and, and then we're going to practice it together. So, RAIN is recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. One woman I worked with, and this was back when I was active as a psychotherapist, was really upset about her daughter, her teen daughter. She was a high school senior and her grades were tanking and she was smoking a lot of pot and she, the two of them had a very angry, defensive, distant, the daughter was defensive, the mom was, was angry. But she felt really responsible ultimately. She was had a full-time job and she felt like she wasn't attending well enough. So she felt responsible and angry at her daughter's behavior. So we did RAIN together and the R of RAIN recognized, she recognized that she was angry. And I encourage people when they're recognizing whatever's going on to just mentally whisper the word. And, and I'll tell you why, that there's a lot of research now that when we consciously note an emotion, uh, we end up being a little bit free from it. In other words, our limbic system quiets down and the prefrontal cortex gets activated. So there's a power to naming what you're aware of. So that's recognize. The A of RAIN, this belongs, or this is okay, or just let it be here. What that means, allowing, not that we like it, but just that we're not pushing it away. We're not trying to fix it. We're just letting it be there for the time being. And I often say to myself, this belongs during the allowing. The reason is because I think of it like waves in the ocean. Right now, these are the waves and just to honestly acknowledge them. They belong for this moment. And so for her, allowing the anger, just letting it be there, and then the investigate is to investigate in the body. It's not going through a lot of history of, well, my mother treated me this way, and that made me feel angry towards her, but my father did so. It's not that. So she was feeling the anger in her body and as she let the anger really be in its fullness, feeling her chest and the heat and the kind of explosive feeling, she could sense under it was fear, the squeeze of fear. And with that, a lot of shame. And and it was a sense that it's my fault. You know, all of this is my fault, what's happening. And I asked her how familiar that was, how long she had been feeling that in some way, it, things were her fault. 
and it was as long as she could remember. Even as a child, she felt in some way she was failing. She was falling short. So the investigate was that deep feeling of failing and falling short. And when she realized how long she had been really in that trance of unworthiness, she felt this wave of sorrow. And I see this happen. It's kind of a, a soul sadness when we sense the landscape of our life, when we realize how many moments have you lost being at war with yourself, when you could have been enjoying a sunset or just feeling creative or being with somebody else in a, in a loving way. So she, she got that soul sadness and, and this is the investigating. And then we began to turn towards nurturing and we asked, what is this place in you that's feeling, you know, ashamed and sad? What does it most need right now? Um, and it, what it needed to know was that she was doing her best and that she should trust her loving heart. So the N of RAIN is nurture. And as I mentioned, um, you can put your hand on your heart with nurturing. You can send a loving message or just feel care, go to the place that needs it. And that's what she did. She put her hand on her heart and just told herself, you know, trust, trust your goodness, trust your heart. And after she did this, and this is what I call after the rain, you know, it's like with a real rain, after the rain falls, it's those moments and days afterwards that you see the kind of flowering. Well, in after the rain, after you walk through the four steps of rain, that's when you can start to feel a shift that's occurred inside you. And it's really valuable to just notice the quality of presence that's come up. And for her, she could sense that rather than being identified as an angry self or a failing self, she was resting really in a space of compassion, of presence. So she did this a number of rounds of rain as she was being triggered by her daughter. And she found over about a month or so that she started seeing her daughter through new eyes, that she could start to see her daughter's fears and insecurities. And rather than in talking to her, you know, coming, leading with anger, she was leading with a lot more kindness and presence. And that created a, a safe enough space for them to really begin communicating again. So rain, reconnects us with the best of what we are really, with our inner resources, our, our wisdom and our heart. And sometimes when it's a really deep issue, it, we have to do many, many rounds and we have to practice on the sidelines. You know, in the moment that we're triggered, it may be hard to create a clearing. But at other times we can actually do a light rain and we're gonna practice a light rain together. We can do it right on the spot. Maybe I'll, I'll share a, another story of, of that where um, this is some years ago, a lieutenant in the army was taking an anger management course. He was required to take it. And it had the components of rain in it with, you know, the mindfulness of recognizing and letting be what's there and the compassion. Well, one day he was shopping in a supermarket and he had a lot of things to do and he had a big pile of groceries and he got in line. The woman in front of him, she had a young child. She only had one item, but she wasn't in the express lane. She was in his lane. And not only that, she and the clerk were kind of ooing and eyeing over the child. Well, he got triggered. He got really angry internally, <laughs> you know, but he was going, you know, who does she think she is? And I'm a busy person. I've got a lot to do. And what are they doing socializing like this? And then, oh yeah. That's the flag, you know, time to practice some mindfulness. So inwardly, he just recognized he was angry and let it be there and felt into his body and, and could feel underneath the anger. And it's so often like this, that, that deep anxiety, like if I don't get things done, my whole life will fall apart, you know, that, that fear. And he recognized that and he sent some, just some kind allowing energy to it. When he looked up, he could, he just had a little more space and he could see that the little girl was really cute. So 
his turn, the woman and her, and the woman and the little girl had left, it's his turn. And he says to the clerk, well, that little girl is really adorable. And the clerk beamed. She said, oh, thank you. Well, that's my daughter. You see, my husband was killed in Afghanistan last year and my mom takes her over to visit me twice a day. So we have a little time together. And I, I don't share this with you because it's not like everybody we meet has just had that great a loss. But the truth is, everyone we encounter has some vulnerability they're living with. And we're all in such uncertain times. Our, we don't know. Our bodies have always have things going on. We lose people we love. It's a vulnerable world. You know, that phrase, be kind, everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle, including yourself. Well, it's the truth. And I sometimes think, you know, what if we really could be with each other and pause enough to create a clearing, you know? And so that we could be, you know, notice what's coming up in us and just calm and, and be kind and see each other with more realness so that the other is not such an unreal other. The other really is a human like us. There's a, um, a little metaphor that helps me on this, which is if you imagine you're in the woods and you see a little dog under a tree and you go to pet the dog, but the dog lurches at you and its fangs are bared and you know it's aggressive and you shift from feeling friendly to being angry. And then you notice that the dog has its leg in a trap and you shift again, you know, oh, you poor thing. And you may not go over to pet it because it may be dangerous, but your heart has shifted. And so it is with us and other beings. It's if somebody is causing harm, acting in ways you don't like, They've got their leg in a trap, most likely. Internally, they're not in a happy place. There's some unmet need, there's some fear, there's some hurt. And similarly, when you act in ways you don't like, if you really take time to investigate, you'll find underneath that, that you're hurting in some way. And if we could remember that, you know, if we could just remember that we're all struggling and we all have our leg in a trap at times, um, it really helps us to be kinder in the world. We suffer when we forget our belonging to each other and to our inner life. So rain is a pathway back to that belonging. It helps us make a clearing. It helps us reconnect. And I've shared a lot of words about it, and it feels like this would be a good time now for us to try it out. <laughs> and I'd like to lead you in a, in a light rain meditation. So wherever you are right now, if you want to change how you're sitting and make yourself more comfortable, find a posture that allows you to be alert so you're awake, but also at ease. So take a moment, allow yourself to settle. You might take a few full breaths to help collect your attention. It's nice to breathe in deeply and fill the chest and the lungs. And let the out breath be slow so you can actually feel the release of the breath. Again, inhaling deeply. A slow out breath, letting go, letting go. And one more time, nice deep in-breath. And breathing out, softening down the length of the body, relaxing, letting go. And then letting your breath resume in its natural rhythm. You might scan your life and sense if there's a place where you get stressed and reactive would you kind of know there's a limbic hijack or it triggers in some way, you're sensing anxiety, uh, perhaps you've turned on yourself, perhaps you're feeling blame or anger towards others. 
So take a few moments and find for yourself a situation where you know that you get reactive and you'd like to have more of a pathway home. It may be something to do with a relationship, tension in a relationship, maybe something that's happening work-related, finances, health, not something that brings up trauma. That won't be so useful as you're training in on RAIN. And once you've found situation, take some moments to enter the experience, to bring it back fully to mind. So you're visualizing the setting you're in, the room, what's there. And if another person's involved, you're seeing perhaps their face and remembering their tone of voice, their words. So you're getting in touch with whatever it is that's bringing up the distress, that's triggering you. And allow yourself to sense into the worst part of it for you, what's really bothering you. So we begin rain with recognizing what's happening. Just notice whatever feeling's most predominant. Maybe fear, or anger, agitation, distress, embarrassment, anxiety. And explore naming it, either a silent or an out loud whisper. Just whispering the word. The A of RAIN is to allow whatever's happening to be just as it is. And you can experiment just saying, this belongs, or let be. I sometimes say the word yes. It's not, I like this, it's just yes, this is the truth of the moment. Just letting it be. And then you can begin to investigate and your superpower in investigating is be curious so you can find out more about how you're experiencing this. Let it be gentle and curious, your attention. And you might sense the worst part of this again for yourself. What's the worst part of what's happening? What are you most afraid is going to happen? What are you most upset about? You might even sense, what are you believing? What are you believing is going to go wrong? Or what are you believing about yourself or the other person? And when you're believing this, where do you feel the emotions in your body? And check your throat, your chest, your belly. You might even put your hand where you're feeling any vulnerability. In a way, you're beginning nurturing as you investigate. And notice what it feels like inside when you're feeling this emotion. If you want to deepen your investigation, let your whole posture express what you're feeling. Nobody's watching, so you can kind of just let it, let it express it. Your shoulders might slump, chest might cave in a little bit, your hands maybe are in fists. Let your facial expression kind of represent your feelings. And then notice again in your body, what does it feel like? Just investigate and feel what's there. And as if you could lean in and really 
communicate with the place that feels most vulnerable, most upset, just ask, oh, what do you need right now? How do you want me to be with you? And notice, does this part of you want understanding? Does it want acceptance? Company? Being embraced in some way? Forgiveness? Love? Compassion? Sensing what's needed and then the nurturing is to really offer that from your most awake, wise heart. You might, if you're not already doing it, experiment by having your hand gently at your heart, touching your heart, and like actually vary the pressure so it's, it's tender, that you're actually with your touch conveying care. And you might offer a message Whatever reminders most needed right now it might be simply, you're okay. You're enough. Trust yourself. Or maybe I'm here, I'm not leaving. If it's fear in there, you might say, thank you for trying to protect me. I'm okay right now. Or maybe you're held in love. So experiment, sense what message might be helpful, feel that touch. Most important, just send warmth and care to the part of you that's upset. And if it's hard to hold yourself with love, you might call on some larger source of loving, the wisdom and love that flows through someone you trust. You might bring to mind a friend or a grandparent, a teacher, a healer, a spiritual figure. Some people bring to mind their pets, their dogs, their cats. Just imagine whoever you bring to mind that their care is flowing into you. So that whether you're offering love from your own heart or from some other source, let the vulnerability inside you be bathed in care, in love. Let the love into the cells and the spaces between the cells, just really washing through your entire being. And now taking a moment to widen the attention and simply sense the quality of presence that's emerged. Perhaps some more space or more of a sense of kindness, more openness, to whatever degree. For some it's just a little bit, for some it's a lot. But mostly notice the shift from where you started, maybe a fearful self or an angry self, to having more awareness, more presence. And just know this natural awareness and presence is more the truth of who you are than any story that you might tell yourself. As you're ready, take a few full breaths and open your eyes. Welcome back. Uh, Just a comment or two, and then we're going to be turning to questions that you might have. And one is that the entire RAIN process is always customized. So whatever you're doing with it right now, you'll find that the more you explore and experiment, the more it'll become a natural process for you. And repetition makes a difference. It's like whatever we practice gets stronger. 
So if you practice regularly creating a clearing and bringing attention inward and bringing some kindness inward, you'll find that it's, it's as the neuroscientists say, those neural pathways will get stronger and you'll have more and more quick access to that clarity and to that inner ease and to that open heartedness. So I do encourage you to practice. Alex, I think that's enough words for right this moment. Um, what kind of questions do we have? Yes, let's dive in. There have been several coming through the chat. Um, so let's start with the first question, please. How can we keep the limbic brain from taking over during difficult conversations with friends, family, coworkers, etc.? Oh, I love that question, since that is on so many people's minds right now. <laughs> Um, we can't stop it from kicking in, but if we practice on the sidelines, and that really means that when you're not in the midst of a difficult conversation, practice it. Imagine that person, imagine what would come up, imagine what comes up in you, you know, just how alarming or horrified or upset, whatever their views are, and learn to bring rain to that. And what you'll find is that you can, over time, practicing rain on the sidelines, um, do a lot better when you're navigating in person. And this is, you know, just think of it like, you know, weightlifting on the sidelines and you get into onto the streets. Well, that's a very militaristic analogy. But if you practice kindness lifting, <laughs> where you actually are bringing care and kindness and attention to what's going on inside, you'll be able to do it much more quickly and calm yourself when you're, when you're in the mix. And please do it because we all need to find a way to have those conversations with others. I found for myself that if I do rain on the sidelines, then when I'm in a conversation, rather than being as defensive and reactive, I actually can get interested and want to understand really what life is like for this other person. How did they come to have this view? And if we're to make bridges in this world, more of us need to seek to understand so that we can actually remember what we share in common um, I, and I'll say one other thing. There was one very lively disagreement with a lot of heat going on in a group I was in. And one person said to the other, well, can we just agree on a baseline that all of us want to decrease suffering? The other person said, oh, yeah, we can agree on that. And there was something about being able to find the ground level of that we care about each other, that we care about the world. And then even if we have very different understandings of what should happen after that, we're able to stay in communication. So a bit of a long answer because your question matters to me a lot and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Perfect. Let's see what else we have on the live chat. How can we recommend and encourage RAIN to others who would benefit from it? Yeah, it's a good question. I remember once when I was first practicing a Buddhist meditation, we were we were reminded to go ahead and uh, be a, a Buddha, not be a Buddhist. <laughs> you know, that it's really your your own increased uh, kindness and radiance and centeredness and so on is an inspiration, and you can share what you're doing, and then somebody else might get interested. People that do things can never be pushed into doing anything. But the other thing to mention to you is that a lot of people love to do RAIN as partners with other people. And on my website, I've got a whole section on how to have a RAIN partner. And we have found that it goes much deeper when people pair up and do it because you hold a space for another person and both people kind of stay accountable and in the process. And it actually makes it safer. And we find that what we're bringing to work on feels less like there's less pathology because we're all just sharing, working on stuff. And it, we get that it's not as personal. Mm 
So one way you can, you know, if you want others to practice is if you want to do rain partners with them, not because they're sick and they need it, but because together you can actually wake up and heal. I like the idea of rain partners. It is something that I personally use. Before we jump to the next question, um, I wanted to ask one around uh, the investigate part mm. of rain, Tara, because I think for me and I, uh, some other folks that this feels sometimes like an internal debate happening when we get to that investigate where, you know, the, the self-compassion and the idea of kind of trying to nurture yourself tries to push through. And then this other voice that's been trained for our whole lives comes up saying things like, you know, maybe you could have actually done better, or maybe, maybe there is a little bit of truth in that. So when we're first starting off with rain and we're struggling a little bit with that investigate debate, do you have any tips uh, to help the, the compassion side win per se? <laughs> I love that. Well, you know, we're all wired to want to improve and progress. And for most of it, that comes with the fear that, you know, if we get too accepting and too kind, we're going to fail, we're going to miss out on what's important. So we have linked driving ourselves, judging ourselves to accomplishment. And it's actually not a, a true link. Um, what happens when we're driving ourselves is we don't really end up experiencing real transformation. It's kind of like the, the American psychologist Carl Rogers put it best. He said, it wasn't until I accepted myself just as I was that I was free to change. So there's a quality of acceptance and kindness that really is a precursor to changing. We, we don't punish ourselves into healing. But having said that, when we're investigating, the key thing is just to get curious. It's like we're asking the question, what's really happening here? And we're feeling in our bodies, as I described in the stories, maybe we're feeling angry, but when we investigate, we find out, nah, it's really hurt. Or maybe we're, maybe we're feeling a sense of fear, but we sense underneath that, the deepest thing is shame that I'm failing, you know? So, Investigate helps us unlayer by feeling in our body what's there and naming it and just letting it be there. We don't have to get kind at that point, but just gentle and curious. Now the nurturing, if we have really investigated, we're going to arrive at a place that feels vulnerable. And the nurturing actually comes quite naturally once we've really touched the vulnerability. In fact, the, the whole alchemy of compassion is when we've touched pain, we get more tender. So if you get the sense of, wow, I've really been struggling with this trance of unworthiness for, for many years and look what it's done to my life. There will be, I think of it as an ouch moment where you, there's, where you actually can witness yourself with real kindness. And that's where the, and then you, activate it with the nurturing, where you actively express care. And even if in the nurturing, you're going through the motions a little, you're kind of just repeating it, the fact that deep down your intention is to be kind will actually bring up much more of a moist, tender heartedness. So I hope that's helpful in what you're working with, Alex, and for others too. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Let's do a few more questions. Ah, I feel overwhelmed by how many meditations you release. Do you recommend staying with one meditation for extended periods or mixing it up frequently and doing different ones? Thanks a lot. I love that <laughs> because it really is worth finding the general components of a meditation that work for you. And, um, and each of us has different components. A lot of the meditations I offer have certain common denominators, which are, I really think it's helpful to get into our bodies. So I often do a body scan. And the second common denominator is once we are in our bodies and more present, it's really helpful to have the capacity to let whatever's here arise 
without any judgment, just to, to let it be there. And then the third thing I often, you know, include in a meditation is actively offering kindness. So for you, I would suggest finding one or a few med guided meditations that have the components that most are serving you. And this is really an inquiry for all of us. You know, we don't want to go to a banquet and keep on tr keep on testing out different things, but really not drop deep into our skillfulness in a practice. But nor do we want to be rigid about one practice. So find your balance and experiment and find the meditation or sets of meditation that you sense at this season of life are most awakening your heart and your mind. So I hope that's helpful. Great. How about what are a few small steps we can take today to reduce anxiety and live in the moment? Mm, I love it. Well, even right this moment, if you just say, okay, what would it mean to create a clearing in this moment. And for me, whenever I ask that, it's like, okay, just sense, well, what's, what's happening right now inside me? And can I be with this? So what you can do right now is take those two questions and really find out what happens when you ask them at any moment of the day, what's happening inside me right now? And can I be with this? And you can add a little dimension to it you know, what's happening inside me right now and feel in your body. And can I be with this with kindness? And if you, whenever you remember, just ask those two questions, you'll create a lot more of those clearings that let you feel at home with yourself. So I really, I appreciate that question because that's really the rubber hits the road that we want today, not in the long distant future to be able to calm ourselves, if the anxiety gets strong and you're aware of it, to add a gesture of kindness actively. I find for myself, <clears throat> even if I can just remember the idea of kindness, <laughs> you know, any, any notion of kindness, even if I can remember the words, please be kind, it's really helpful. And another thing that I found really helps is I sandwich my day with meditation. I, I begin my day with meditation. I end my day with meditation. And um, it doesn't matter how long. Um, even I have, I have certain normal lengths for myself. But the reason I love it so much is that in the morning, whatever I do to quiet and come home to myself, I always end by in some way sensing my aspiration to be kind through the day. And I'll, I'll think of who I'm, I'm going to be with and what's going to happen. And just having that intention, you know, may I be open hearted. And then at the end of the day, when I sit and I, I kind of review the day, not through a critical lens, which of course is quite easy to do, but through that lens of real curiosity. So was I kind or did I get hijacked? And what I find is that if I was kind, I just feel grateful, you know, and if I got hijacked, I, I can learn a little more from it and deepen my resolve for the next day. It teaches me. But in some ways that that holding the day with meditation actually makes each day more of an adventure because I really feel this sense of, you know, engaging and feeling like I can show up more in my moments. Yeah. And I think there've been a, a few comments and questions around how do we do this in the moment? How do we remember in the moment? And having those phrases or those gestures or something that is so quick that you can just in that moment, even if it's just that word kindness that comes to mind will help when it's harder to remember to do so. That's right. It's having having the gestures like anchors that you can go back to. Some people, their anchors, their body, just scan their body, just relax your shoulders, soften your hands and feel your body right now. And that'll help to bring you back. So the combination of having anchors for the moment and then setting your intention at the beginning of each day, letting that be your practice, will keep inclining your body mind to remembering more. Perfect. I think we'll have time for one more question before we enter into the uh, closing. So let's do one final question. 
any tips for teaching this to young children? There's a five-year-old who might be able to benefit from it. Oh, beautiful, thank you. Well, the first is to make sure that you're using it wherever you're reactive or not present with the five-year-old because that way you'll be actually a living transmission of the teachings. You invite them into a creative presence. The other is not in the form of sit still and follow your breath, but in the form of moving through life and pointing out things and having them savor them, having them take them in, having them be able to pause to really appreciate what's going on uh, within and around them. And if they're agitated, um, it's not an intellectual way of explaining to them how you have to come back from that limbic hijack, but your own non-reactive presence, you will have a much more intuitive sense of what's going to help to bring them back online and stabilize them. So I give a whole lot of credit to parents that really weave in rain to their parenting as more of the emphasis than what they're actually teaching their child. I love, I love the question. Thank you. Well, as we only have a, a few minutes left, Tara, I, I wanted to, to ask, how do we keep top of mind everything that you shared so far in this talk? Tomorrow, next week, next year, the idea that these challenging moments will still continue to surface. Um, but what does a gentle practice actually look like for us? Well, the biggest thing is we so quickly convert things into shoulds to not have meditation as a should. You know, have meditation as an expression of caring about your life and caring about the others around you. And a lot of times I liken it to when we're training our hearts and minds, which is what we're doing, just like exercise. We know it's good. Exercise is good for our bodies and meditation really nourishes our minds and our spirit that, that we're offering that as a gift to ourselves. And it's kind of like training a puppy, you know, in the way we would, you know, a puppy might go and pee in the corner, like our minds do far worse, <laughs> but you know, not to punish, um, but really with, with a, a steadiness and a firmness and also total friendliness, um, we remind ourselves to come back. We remind ourselves to be here. So that's one piece. Another piece is daily matters. It makes a really big difference. And I remember when my son was an infant and I had, you know, for some months not stopped meditating regularly. And I kind of started realizing that I had had a lot of money in the bank, but I was using it up quickly in terms of having some resilience and balance. So I committed myself to practicing every day, no matter what. But my back door was, it doesn't matter how long. And some days I would be completely busy all through the day. At the very end of the day, I would sit still for a moment, take a few mindful breaths, offer a prayer to the world and collapse. <laughs> but other times, it was a much I had a, had a much longer sit, but the point is this: that it it's really a gift to the soul to have that rhythm. Nature loves rhythms, and to have that daily rhythm where you're coming home to yourself, or at least your intention is. Like one of my friends says, you put your tush on the cush, and you take what you get. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> happens is fine. So um, there are ways of learning how to practice. And I'd like to invite each one of you. Uh, we have a free 40-day uh, program called Mindfulness Daily. And each day it'll give you 15 minutes. Part of it is um, a short teaching and then part of it is a guided meditation. And it, and it sequentially will build your practice. So at the end of 40 days, if you put those 15 minutes in, you'll have established the roots of a really strong, nourishing practice. And we'll email you about it, but you can, if you go on my website, tarabrock.com, it's on the left side and you'll see it, Mindfulness Daily. I also have a new course on rain out. So if you want to go deeper into the rain practice, that course will help you. And my book, Radical Compassion, will help you. And beyond that, 
on my website, as one friend here named, there are tons of meditations. We have probably over 500 meditations, but there's meditations under the category of basic, and we have special themes, and you can you can use those however you wish. Um, include, and we also have you know 700 talks. You can use them to support your practice. So. It, I'm not the only website. There's tons and tons of resources in this world on meditation. The key is st set up a regular practice and get support. Do it with others. It really makes a difference. Um, join me on my Wednesday nights or my Saturdays or join some group of people that are practicing because that'll keep you uh, steady and supported. Perfect. Tara, any final words of wisdom for us here on the talk? Uh, thank you for asking. I think maybe what I would say is, and I started with this, is it's a real gift to keep creating a clearing. You you know, we just tumble into the future. And it's as if we're racing to the finish line. And what's that? It's death. So how to arrive in our moments to keep making a clearing. And I mentioned that poem from Martha Postlewaite. I thought maybe I'd close by reading it. And here, here you go. She says, do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. Create a clearing in the dense forest of your life. So thank you, friends, for your attention and presence. And I hope to cross paths again. Thank you so much, Tara, for all of your work and for joining us today.